Welcome to Why I Hate Your Podcast. These days, there are a lot of podcasts to choose from. This is another one. I'm Crystal, and each week my brother Sean and I meet up to talk about two podcasts and why we hate them, or don't. Join us and we might help you find your new favorite podcast, or save you from wasting time on a podcast you might hate. So today's podcast, we'll be talking about Astronomy Cast. Astronomy Cast is run by two, uh, has two hosts. Uh, one is Fraser Kane, who is a uh, publisher, uh, editor, I believe he even owns uh, a website called Universe Today, which talks about the current news and happenings in the astronomy, uh, NASA, space world kind of stuff. And then his co-host is Dr. Pamela Gay, uh, who is an astronomer uh, at Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. Uh, Although I don't think she teaches there anymore. Uh, She works at Planetary Science Institute, which is also in Edwardsville, Illinois. Uh, So they've been doing this podcast weekly for quite a while now. Let's see. It was... uh, They've been doing this since 2006, so (laughs) there's 14 years worth of weekly podcasts, and I don't think they've really missed many weeks, because their back catalog is massive. (laughs) And I started listening to them probably, I don't know, probably around the 2010 era, and uh, I really enjoyed it. The podcast is, they'll talk about either subjects relating to astronomy, cosmology, or it could be something newsworthy at the time like oh the kipler satellite just launched let's talk about that for an episode or they can just go back and say okay let's talk about something we haven't talked about before that could be old like the general relativity or you know quantum mechanics or just you know almost kind of an arbitrary subject but it all deals with something in the astronomy field or the cosmology field so it, for me personally I, i've really enjoyed it i, I learned a lot from it I think Frazier is really good at the podcasting scene. He's got very kind of good natural presence, I think. Pamela Gay, she is very calm and collected and very, uh, I, I find her enjoyable to listen to, but she is very intelligent. And I think one of her strengths as well is, is to explain a lot of these, some of these sometimes really complex topics in a way that really anybody can listen to, which I think is one of the strengths of the podcast that if you don't really, you don't have to have a background in science or astronomy or cosmology or anything to appreciate the topics within the podcast. I've been listening to it for a long time, uh, and I know it's uh, something, you know, recently introduced to you. So what do you think? Um, yeah, so I went back on your recommendation. I listened to some specific episodes, you know, some of the really old episodes, actually. In fact, I kind of was, was laughing because they... they you know, part of their outro was, you know, make sure to circle us on Google Plus. And I was like, oh, wow, this is really old. <laughs> but they, I listened to a pretty good smattering of episodes. I want to say about eight or maybe eight or nine episodes. I, I did the series that they did on space stations, which I thought was really, really fascinating because, it, you know, everybody, I, I'm kind of a NASA nerd, but I haven't always been. So or, or I was more casual about it in the past. I didn't really know the full history of Mir and some of the other space stations aside from the ISS and Skylab and things like that. So yeah, I, I overall, I thought it was really good. I agree that she, Pamela Gay specifically, is really, really good at explain, explaining concepts and she has a great, great presentation style. I mean, you can tell she's an educator. She's clearly really good at presenting this kind of information. I think if you struggle with things like quantum mechanics, that might not help because it's that's something that I really struggle with understanding. And the, the episode on Schrodinger's cat, I still, it, it, it all came down to the whole, you know, until you observe something, it is it is all possible states exist at once. And I still don't get that. Like my head just doesn't <laughs> process that. Like I can't, it doesn't make sense to me. So, you know, but she did a really great job of explaining that concept to the, as best as you can, you know, to, to somebody who doesn't study or doesn't work in that field. Right. Okay. And so then, and then as Schrodinger sort of originally described his experiment, I mean, what was the the pieces of the puzzle that he recommend that he sort of in his joke, I guess, the way he put it together, because I know it's kind of morphed into other things since then, right? So, so for Schrodinger, the idea was you take a cat, a healthy, nice cat, you put it in a box that will generally preserve its life, and you put in the box with the cat something radioactive that is going to undergo a radioactive decay. 
and you put with it something, a Geiger counter, some manner of detecting the radiation that is given off during that decay process in there with the cat, and you attach to that decay detector a vial of poison. And the second the detector detects a decay, it releases the poison and the poison kills the cat. So the idea is that the entire system is one convolved set of wave functions where at any given moment, the wave functions that describe all the different possible states of all the different possible atoms are causing the cat's wave functions to be in states of dead or alive all at the same time that it all gets entangled together until someone external observes the system and goes, cat is dead, therefore detector detected, nuclear decay process, therefore something decayed. Now, the reality is the cat does observe its own death. It, it knows when it died, or the autopsy will determine that. Right. But it's still one of those, oh, that's kind of freaky kind of, kind of things. Yeah, overall, I mean, it's, it's, it's well done. I was kind of shocked at how good the audio quality was in some of the older episodes, these really old episodes I was listening to, because these were clearly back from like, I think the ones I was listening to were from around 2010. Um, and another kind of weird flashback they were talking about, she was specifically asking people to contact their Congress people about uh, the funding cuts that were happening in 2010 to NASA and specifically uh, science education as a part of NASA. And I was like, oh, I completely forgot about that. So it is kind of fun to go back and listen to old episodes, especially if they're about, you know, quote unquote, current events at the time. But yeah, I, I, it really was... Uh, informative. It's well presented. The episodes aren't long. Um, like I said, I was able to crank through like eight or nine of them fairly easily because I think at least on those older episodes, they were all about a half hour long. I thought it was really informative. I think they're both very good presenters. Um, they're both good hosts and they seem to have a, a pretty good chemistry together. Um, but I think Pamela Gay specifically, she's she is very good at this. Like I could see her doing TED Talks and, and obviously teaching classes because she has a history of doing that. And, and she's definitely not uh, one. So, like, someone like Neil deGrasse, T- or DeGrasse Tyson or whatever, you know, who has a massive ego. Like, you know, he just yeah. he has a huge ego. He thinks he's he's always the smartest guy in the room, kind of ego. Yes, <clears throat> she has no qualms about saying like, you know what, you know, I think she may even said in the Schrodinger cat episode that. It's it's hard to conceptualize, and there's only a few people who, in their mind, it makes sense if they're not looking at it on paper kind of thing. Yeah, I think she said specifically, if you say you understand quantum mechanics, you don't understand quantum mechanics or something like that. That made me feel a little better. <laughs> right, right. And there's only a handful of people who actually can conceptualize it in their heads. So, And I think one of the reasons why she has such a good... Uh, in an engaging way of explaining things, because one, she is an educator, but she's really big into uh, citizen science projects as well. Um, Mm, Yes. So that's like a really big thing with her. So uh, what is it? It's uh, the Zooniverse project, uh, which she's done a lot of work on that, which uh, if nobody's checked that out, that, that it's one of those things where as a casual person, you can contribute to science. So she's done some work for them. And uh, she's really big about science outreach as well to get people who may not be interested in science uh, into science. And so that's kind of like where her a lot of her work has gone uh, outside of her education space. And I think that really kind of helps to set her up to be able to explain these sometimes really complex comp, uh, complex um, theories. For example, one of the ones that I can't remember which episode it was. Uh, where she talked about the paper slit experiment. Um, Don't think I listened. Yeah, to that one. so she that was one that I've heard about. It. It's it's about getting an electron to move through a specific you know target essentially, and uh, she had a it's a very complex thing, but she did a really good job of explaining it to where it made a lot of sense of what why that experiment is important. What's funny is that they did uh, one series, which I highly recommend. It's called The Tour of the Solar System, which is they talk about uh, one specific object in the solar system for a whole episode. And their episodes range between 30 minutes to an hour. And they'll start with the sun, and they just kind of move out from there. And once they've done that series, they move on to the next series. Like, okay, well, what's outside the solar system? And they keep going. 
and they come to the conclusion that the universe is always trying to kill you. That, and that's become kind of a tagline of the series, uh, at least from 2011, 2012 forward, is that the universe is trying to kill you, which is true because it's it's pretty much in, inhospitable everywhere except for we, where we are. And even then, it's still trying to kill you. Yeah, the the episode, one of the episodes you had me listen to was specifically called The Universe is Trying to Kill You. And it was, oh, they yeah. had a guest on. I don't remember the guest's name, but he was the one, I think he had written a book specifically about all the ways the universe is trying to kill you. And so they spent a good deal of time, you know, discussing that um, during that specific episode. And it was actually kind of entertaining and horrifying at the same time but it it was it was pretty interesting i had to say i i really enjoyed that series that uh, particular episode that you you recommended yes cuz there's some uh there's some terrible ways you the universe can kill you um yeah but and and i will say even though they've been around a long time and i know a lot of episodes you listen to are a lot of older episodes they do now their podcast uh they do live stream it also on youtube now um oh okay and they do have a whole section of the pod, which I don't know if it makes it into the podcast format, uh, but where they kind of, you know, spend time interacting with chat and uh, reading super chats and stuff like that. So interacting with the people. So that's another way to en- engage if uh, you do enjoy the podcast is to also watch the live stream so you can actually interact with them. It doesn't surprise me. I didn't know that, but it doesn't surprise me because in some of those older episodes, they were um, talking about the fact that they did uh, a lot of Google Hangouts with people who listen mm-hmm. to the podcast where you know you could talk directly to them and i think they even mentioned that they had done i think it was the first year i don't know if they've done it since but they did like a astronomy cast cruise where it was yes, obviously it was like yes. a small cruise ship i think because it was only like i think like it was less than 100 people but they talked about that as well so it does sound like they're pretty interactive with their fans and with you know with the, the kind of space and science community as a whole because like I mentioned, you, you mentioned the, the Zooniverse thing. She also, and I'm not going to remember what it was, but at least back in some of those old episodes, they were talking about a similar project that they were launching where, you know, you could help with, uh, I think it was Mapping the Moon was the first one. Yeah. But they were looking for, you know, just, just everyday people to assist um, to assist with it and kind of participate in the, in the scientific process for that. So it was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and I don't know now... I want to say they do have a Patreon. I'm not 100% positive. I'll have to go back and look. They've kind of, and this is probably a slight or a small criticism, but since the podcast has been around for so long, there's only so much to talk about that a lot of their most recent stuff is not as interesting as I think is their older stuff because they've covered so many things. It's like there's not a lot else to talk about unless some major news event happens. Um, mm. In terms of astronomy, so that was kind of one of the one of the reasons why I recommended an earlier episode back when they still have a lot of meat left to talk about. But I do believe that they are fun about Patreon because even even from the earlier episodes to the new episodes now, no ad reads. They had in the old ones they did have an ad read at the beginning of each episode because they were sponsored by something called Eighth Light, which was. I think some sort of soft, it was Agile Software Development Company or oh, something. Oh, that's, okay, yeah, you're right. I do vaguely remember that now, yeah. I, yeah. I, I hadn't gone back and listened to those old episodes now, but uh, even on the newer episodes, though, I don't believe there's really any ad reads. I would think not, probably, if they've got a Patreon. They're probably just relying on that for uh, the bulk of their, their monetization. And right. I do want to check out some of the newer episodes, and I guess since I listened to a bunch of older ones, um, with the current episodes, do they still talk about kind of what's going on? Do they talk about what's going on in the private space, you know, like with all the SpaceX and ULA and all the different types of launches and stuff that's going on, like Starlink, things like that. Do they talk about that or do they stay focused mostly on astronomy? Oh, no, they talk about that. They usually talk about any, uh, and when I say news, it, it could be the launch of new satellites, uh, you know, any interesting okay. stuff. So, like, yeah, definitely. I don't know if they talked about Starlink yet. Uh, that maybe I have to go back and look. Um, but uh, they definitely do talk about, you know, the commercial or private sector of space travel and stuff. Um, so yeah, I'd, be, it, I'd be surprised if they didn't haven't talked about Starlink because I know it's kind of controversial from especially from an astronomist uh, standpoint. Yeah. You know, there's a lot yeah. of a lot of debate going on about it. You know, like oh, it's great, it's going to provide internet to all these places where you can't normally have internet, but at the same time, it's kind of impacting the night sky and and you know making it harder to see. Um, you know, from a stargazing perspective. 
So I know that's, I'd be interested to see what their take on that is. Yeah, actually, it's a good point. I'd have to go and look and see. Because uh, I, I unfortunately haven't kept up with them in the last year, two years, uh, like I did before. Uh, mm. Simply because, you know, again, it was more or less talking about more of the news as opposed to just topics. Um, right. Which, there's some interest in that, but for me, it's more or less like, hey, we're going to talk about uh, how information is not lost, that, or information that goes into a black hole is not lost. I find that a lot more interesting than, hey, here's the latest development in the ISS. So, Right. Um, so that's why I've kind of slowly, it's hasn't remained in my rotation but i do occasionally go back and look and see if there's something interesting and then i'll listen to an episode if it's a certain topic that i find really interesting and that's why i think like their earlier episodes is kind of like their kind of golden era in a way and and that's not a, a huge slight against them it's just that they've covered so much yeah i think it is kind of a blessing and a curse if you've been around that long and you have a specific topic because at some point you're going to run out of stuff to talk about. i mean there are there always are new developments and things like like what we were just talking about you know uh crew dragon all these different things that are going on that they can talk about but it's less of the meaty stuff and to your point it's less about the topics and more about just what's happening but i will say a plus there is that you can go to if you've never listened to them like me there is a plethora of of old podcast episodes to listen to that will cover a ton of things. So there's there's this huge library that's sitting there that you can pick through and find stuff that you're interested in. And unlike the last podcast we were talking about, this one, the titles are very relevant. And so you can sort of, I will say in the podcast app I was using in the really, really old episodes, like I'd say their first 200 or so, I don't think they have episode titles. I think there are show notes, but I don't think there's episode titles. But then after a while, they started adding titles. So they are informative. You, you can read the title and go, oh, this is like I, I dug up the series on space stations because each one was called the series about space stations or something like that. So I could tell what they were talking about. But yeah, it's 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 a lot of good information if you're into that kind of thing. There is so much there. And I definitely want to spend some time kind of building up a queue of older episodes that I'm interested in based on the topics. And I may start listening to them ongoing as well, because I mean, my Twitter feed is is like 95% what's going on with space travel right now, because I follow like all these different space researchers and observers and, you know, just different people who, who tweet regularly and provide a lot of information about what's going on. So a podcast would make sense. So I'll probably add it because again, they have a really great delivery method. They seem to have a good chemistry. They're just pleasant to listen to. And they're not, they don't tend to wander off topic. You know, they stay on topic from from what I can tell from what I've listened to. So it's a very focused discussion. Yeah, there, and there's not a lot of banter. Like, I don't know a whole lot about Fraser Kane because he doesn't really talk about himself too much. I know he has some kids and that's about it. And he's Canadian, that's it. And uh, the same thing with Pamela is that not a ton they don't talk about themselves a ton the only thing i really know about her is that you know she's also is in uh, an equestrian so you know i believe they actually own like a, her and her husband own a horse ranch or something that's like it that's like all i know about their personal lives <laughs> uh they just kind of really just dip into it uh and i know she's got a cat that's the other thing <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's like there's very little banter. They kind of dip right into it. And the, the intro is very small, very short. Mm-hmm. And I, I did confirm, yes, they do have a Patreon. And, and they also, they had a recent episode, episode 569, Ethics of Commercial and Military Space, Part 1, Private Space Flight. So it looks like they're going to have a whole series about the ethics of commercial and military space. So Oh, nice. That might... Starlink might come up uh, in the future, in a future episode. So, yeah, that's so. Yeah, that's something to keep an eye on for. And of course, it, perfect example: their latest episode, sample return missions from asteroids, because there was a big news about the fact that we recently landed um, on an asteroid. Yep, yep. And for a return mission, so they're they're talking about that. And the previous episode was the Nobel Prize because I believe the Nobel Prize was recently awarded. Okay. So that's like the latest two episodes. And, and they still have some, like, uh, one is episode 580, which is a new episode, Exploding Dwarfs. It's probably going to be talking about exploding dwarf stars, which is a very specific topic. But again, 
And then the episode before that is Life on Venus because there was you know a talk a paper released that potentially there could be life on Venus. And so that that kind of gives you an idea of like the kind of episodes are you know recently that they're releasing. Okay, yeah, no, that sounds interesting. I definitely want to listen to the series on the the ethics of commercial commercial and military space. That would be like you said, it's it's going to be relevant to a lot of what's going on right now in terms of space travel and and launches from you know. Not just the U.S., but all over the world. There's private space companies now, multiple, multiple places. So yeah, I think that would be pretty interesting to check out. I uh, the one fact that I I noted is every time I heard the name Fraser Kane, I kept thinking of Fraser Crane, and I could not get that image <laughs> out of my head. So I actually had to look up what he looked like. So I would stop picturing. Was it Kelsey Grammer who played Fraser Crane? <laughs> well, to be honest, they don't look terribly dis. I mean, they 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 kind of look similar in a way. Yeah, he's not that far off. Like when I looked him up, I was like, <laughs> so. I'm sure he's got it. You know, heard it millions of times because it's so close to that name. But like the first time I I did a kind of double take, I was like, I've heard this name before, and it took me a second. I was like, Oh, no, that's Fraser Crane. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, he's 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 a bit more of a as a host. He's a bit more. What's the word I would use? Charismatic, maybe? Uh, she's she's very, I mean, like I said, she's got a great presentation style, but it's very much in the the, the kind of method of a, a educator. You know, she's very, here's yeah. the facts, here's the information. And she has a lovely voice, but he sounds a little more like your typical podcast host, somebody who's maybe had experience. Um, I think he was a journalist at one point. But um, he sounds like he has experience, you know, either on radio or doing on screen type of presentation or or something. So he he definitely sounds very practiced at it again. And this was me listening to episodes that were really older. So I'm sure that's only gotten more consistent over time. Yeah, I mean, well, he does run Universe Today, which is a news website. So, okay, um, And I believe he was a photographer at some point. I could be wrong. It seems like a lot of people who are into space and astronomy in general are also like, that's a hobby is photography because <laughs> I, well, it's kind of like a natural progression. You get the telescope, you're like, wow, this is really cool. And then you realize what you could do if you have a, if you combine a telescope with a camera, right? It be, opens up a whole new world of things. So yeah, it's a natural progression, I guess. Well, and living in Florida, you know, we're always, we're pretty close to the space coast. And so you know, a ton of the people that I follow that keep up with what's going on at Kennedy are also amateur photographers. And some of them are really, really good, you know, so and shooting a launch is a really fun thing to do if you're into photography. So I think it just they kind of that all kinds of go, kind of goes together. <laughs> you know, and I'm looking here, it actually it seems like the astronomy cast used to be a part of Universe Today. Um, it looks like it's now part of Cosmo Quest Network. Oh, um, interesting. Okay. So it looks like they do a multiple, they have like a Twitch channel, they have YouTube channels, uh, multiple podcasts. So it looks like they're an entire network of like science-based blogs, podcasts, uh, Twitch channels, which is kind of weird. And so it looks like they're now part of that network. Yeah. And you mentioned something earlier that I think is important to reiterate is that if you are into astronomy and science education in general, and you're really tired of the kind of smarmy, you know, the Neil deGrasse Tysons of the world, which I know I am. Um, I really liked him initially, but he, his ego like quadrupled in size and he's gotten really annoying and obnoxious. These guys are not, they're like the polar opposite of that. Very, very kind of friendly sounding and they make no assumptions about how much they know versus how much either the guests know if they have a guest on or you know, the other hosts, it's just, it's kind of refreshing because you do get, I mean, there's a lot of people out there putting a lot of really great content out on these topics and personality plays a big part in who I listen to when I'm consuming content about these, these topics. Yeah, they, de- they definitely don't have egos, which is excellent. Uh, Cause I feel like, uh, and, and that's the thing is like, you can look there, there's definitely, you have almost kind of like the celebrity astronomer, right? Which Neil deGrasse Tyson's kind of like that upper echelon of them. Yeah. And I don't know if you ever saw the last Joe Rogan episode he was on. He was absolutely insufferable in it. I started to listen to it and I I gave up. I was like, this is, he just came across as a pompous ass the whole entire time. Yeah. Yeah. 
and, and there's a couple others who are like that. Uh, Sean Carroll uh, is pretty good. He's he's kind of awkward in a way, but he's he's pretty decent. And, there, and there's a couple others who are uh, uh, Kraus. Kraus, what's his uh, first name? I can't remember. He's a little arrogant. Um, and then Michio, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, he was on Lex Friedman recently. Michio Kaku or something. Yeah, um, no, I like that guy. Yeah, he's really good, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I definitely don't get a same, uh, feeling that he has like this egotistical personality. But Pamela Gay, definitely, there is no ego about anything. I mean, she's very open to saying, "I don't know this stuff." Right. <laughs> I understand the concept, but I don't know it. But I'm going to explain it the best I can. Right. Um, right. And she's generally going to be a much better person to explain it to you than uh, some average Joe who looked it up on Wikipedia, obviously. <laughs> but uh, she's definitely good at explaining high level stuff for things that she's like i just don't have the ma- the brain for this kind of math but here's the summary of it right yeah i guess you could summarize this podcast as being like if you're if you're interested in space and astronomy and and quantum mechanics and all of those things but you want it in a way that's consumable and you're not being talked down to this is a really great source for that stuff it, it seems like if that's I haven't listened to a recent episode, but it sounds like, you know, from what I've listened to and from what you said, they're just pleasant to listen to and you can really get a lot of great information. Yeah. And and I feel like they're actually passionate about the product or about the subject. Mm -hmm. They're passionate to talk about astronomy and, you know, news and space flight and whatnot. And they're passionate about getting that information out. They're very passionate about that outreach, uh, which seems to be very important for them, which is such a great motivation for them to be like you said not kind of talking down to you yeah yeah i think i think if i were going to be taking a class you know on astronomy i would want an instructor like dr pamela gay she's just very again no ego no pretension you know um like she'll she'll start with the basics she doesn't assume that you know you should know the basics yeah she's really great about it and i i definitely I definitely don't hate this podcast. I will definitely be listening to more episodes. Again, I'm I'm not going to even make an attempt to try to listen to the entire back catalog because I don't think there's enough time in the universe to do that. <laughs> but I will kind of go back and cherry pick the stuff that I'm really interested in. And then I would like to start listening to them more currently. Because again, I, I really like getting great information about what's going on in space travel today and what discoveries are being made and what what's happening and I have a lot of different content I consume on that topic, but I'm always open and welcoming of better or not better perspectives, but different perspectives. And I think theirs is one that I would really appreciate. And it's probably easy to figure out. I, uh, I definitely don't hate this podcast. Uh, I, they they needed money for some project they were doing. This is back in like 2010. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were selling merch because they didn't really have any merch before. And uh, I actually have a poster that says the universe is trying to kill you, <laughs> signed by Dr. Pamela Gay. So, oh, that's awesome. Uh, that kind of tells you like where I sit with it. So I definitely don't hate it. Uh, and someone who's extremely familiar with the entire catalog of their podcast, again, I think the newer stuff is kind of not so much in my wheelhouse, simply because everything that is in my wheelhouse they've covered before. Mm-hmm. But I, I have been known to go back and listen to old, ep- re-listen to old episodes. So I definitely don't mind revisiting some of the uh, things I've heard before from them, uh, which tells you just how much that sometimes I enjoy these, enjoy the certain episodes. Yeah, that's a sign of a really good podcast if you can go back and re-listen to old episodes and still find them enjoyable. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about no such thing as a fish. Um, this is a podcast that is hosted by what well, they're called the QI elves, but it's um, four of the researchers who work on the quiz show QI, which is a British quiz show. And each week they get together and record a podcast where they discuss their favorite facts that they, you know, identified this week during their research for, for you know, the QI quiz show. It's hosted by Anna, Anna Tuzinski, James Harkin, Andrew Hunter Murray, and Dan Schreiber. And I think at least a couple of them are or have been comedians at one point. Um, It's definitely a comedy podcast. And they occasionally will have guests on, generally comedians, uh, either to fill in for one of the regular hosts or just as an additional guest. And so, you know, they'll kind of rotate through 
various comedians that you've probably seen on shows like Graham Norton or just in general if you're a fan of comedy. Uh, It's been around a long time. I think it started, I want to say, in 2014. So it's been around a little while. And I think they're on... I think they release it kind of in seasons. They do a lot of live shows, too. So um, a lot of the recorded episodes are, well, not so much right now with COVID going on. But prior to that, they would do a lot of live shows. So they'll do live recordings as well. And so it's very much a comedy-themed kind of podcast. And I've, I've been listening to it on and off for the last couple of years. I don't listen to every single episode, but I try to catch as many of them as I can. And so I think this was your first time checking it out. What were your initial thoughts? Well, and the title initially, I was like, the first thing that popped in my mind when I read the title was that's a very British humor title. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and generally, the content of it is very that dry British humor. Although it's not as I, I find a lot of British, British humor could either be outrageously hilarious or very esoteric, very dry, or just it's sometimes just kind of weird. Which I didn't really find with this podcast. It was definitely uh, very dry humor, though. And uh, I, I, I actually thoroughly enjoyed it. And you actually learned some interesting facts. Because, uh, like I said, the whole point of the show is they kind of rotate through these weird facts. And uh, I think a lot of times they just... It's not so much the weirdness of it, but the comedy potential of talking about it. That uh, uh, is the reason why they will bring up a certain fact or whatnot. But uh, they're very funny. And uh, it, and it's very conversational. I, I don't think it's scripted at all. I don't feel like it's been scripted. Uh, and and part of me almost thinks that they don't know what each other's facts are before they get on the show. I could be wrong about that, but that's kind of the general feel about it. So they're, the other people are first hearing about it when they actually go to record. And uh, their occasional sniggers or snorts and stuff as they're laughing to themselves is, uh, adds a layer of comedy to it. And there was one guy, I can't remember, in one of the episodes I watched recently, he was so excited for this joke that he was building up <laughs> that <laughs> he almost like couldn't contain himself trying to build up to this joke. Um, and it, I mean, it was a really good joke, but he was like so excited about it. You could tell as he was telling it. Um, right. Which just, you know, it, it, to me, I just found it very funny, but... Um, I will say, though, I mean, even though the humor is very dry and it is funny, it is still British humor, which for Mm -hmm. some people can be a turnoff. Uh, Anybody who sit down and watch British sitcoms, you probably have a general idea of what British humor is like, or if you see Monty Python or something like that. Uh, Although Mm -hmm. Monty Python's kind of more of, I guess, British British version of... uh, what is it, Abram, Abrams and Zucker? The people who did, like, Airplane and Hot Shots. Right, right, Um, yeah. So... Your mileage may vary, but I, I did enjoy it. Yeah, I think um, I, I will say I I think the other hosts are aware of the facts because the facts are generally ones that come up on that the prior uh, week's episode okay. of the QI Quiz Show, um, and I've noticed that sometimes when one of them will bring up a fact, and then the others will chime in with like tertiary facts that are somewhat related. <laughs> no, that know, that's like, that's true. When they were talking about Jeff, the uh, talking. Uh, mongoose they had mentioned about another jeff who was a talking weasel or something in germany or something it was like a a similar case who's also named jeff yes although i think jeff was spelled differently so they're like oh this is totally not related (laughs) they are they do have really great comedic timing i think there's a couple of them that are have a slightly cornier sense of humor i'd Mm -hmm. say andrew andrew hunter murray i think is one of those as well as james harkin they're really really good they have a real knack for being able to work something in like throughout the episode. So I, I was just listening to an episode. I, I went back because they had mentioned that Reese Darby was on a recent one and I really like him as a comedian. So I wanted to hear that episode and I didn't realize, but he has, I don't know if you know who he is. He's a comedian from uh, New Zealand and he has a podcast about cryptids, which is probably going to go on our list because I, I have to at least check that out. So they had a lot of cryptid related facts, you know, or quote unquote facts in that episode. There was this story and I don't even remember how they got to this particular fact, but it was about, I don't even remember. It was the way they would smuggle kids. It was like in Nazi Germany, the way they would, there was this trick for smuggling kids out of, you know, Nazi controlled areas or something. And it has, the joke revolved around mayo and 
in that joke there they they came up with this whole reference to mayo but saying may i instead of mayo and anyway it just ended up working its way in multiple times and it actually it worked every time they they did it it was hilarious every time they brought it up because it just you know it's one of those kind of running gags and they do that very naturally um on a lot of their episodes so i think that just speaks to them being kind of natural comedians or really good comedians so i i, I thought that was that's something I like about it because it feels, even though it, you're right, it doesn't feel scripted at all. They're really good at finding kind of little comedy gold nuggets and then working it and continuing to work it throughout the the episode. Yeah, and uh, I, their chemistry is actually pretty good with each other as well. And I do get the feeling that like they know each other very, very well and they've worked with each other for a very long time, which, again, I guess, you know, with the fact that you said the podcast has been around for quite a while, which, you know, kind of... I guess would explain that, uh, but the chemistry between them all is pretty good, and they're pretty good at at playing jokes off of each other in a sense, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. or picking up on the jokes of others and kind of running with it. So it's almost like they're they're very in tune with each other's comedic timing and you know, and their general style of comedy. So uh, and again, it's for me, it's not a podcast that you're going to be listening to and you're just going to be dying laughing. It's just it's humorous. You're going to get a sensible chuckle while you're listening to it. So, um, which is fine because, you know, I was, I was installing a security system while I was listening to it and, uh, mm-hmm. uh, we bought one of those, uh, install yourself security systems and I wasn't going to be like rolling on the ground laughing, but you know, I, I was thoroughly entertained and there was a couple you know, times you'd crack a smile or whatever. And, and what's interesting is that they'll bring up a fact and they'll expound on that fact, Right. It's not like, oh, here's this weird fact. It's only one statement long, and then they just crack jokes for the rest of the time. There's usually a whole story behind it that they go on, which is actually sometimes actually really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I think I think you're right about their chemistry. They've been working together. I don't know how long they've been working on QI. I mean, obviously they've been around working together on the podcast for a, a long time, but I think QI started back in I want to say it's 2003. It was originally hosted by Stephen Fry, and I think. He's still not. No, he's not still hosting. I think he. Yeah. Okay. As of 2016, it's a new host. But um, and I don't know if you've ever. Yeah, I know. He and he's great. I don't know if you've ever seen the show. I've seen a few episodes of it. Um, I don't remember where. I, I, I don't see think it's broadcast here. I see the clips that occasionally go viral on the internet. Yes. Yes. And so I have a feeling they've worked together for a long time because to your point, they have a really great chemistry and they and they have no problem making fun of each other. I think Anna's the more sensible one, and so she will give them crap if they make a really bad joke, <laughs> and will continue to give them crap about it through the episode. But yeah, it's it's there's definitely a really kind of casual way that they talk that makes you know for sure that the, these guys have worked together for a long time. Yeah, th- that's a good way of putting it. It's very casual, uh, the way they talk to one another. It's basically the perfect toilet paper he invented, but he didn't. Yeah, he, he didn't see it that way. Well, that's the thing with mathematics, isn't it? Like you just study maths for the sake of it because it's beautiful and because the numbers do amazing things. And you never know what the applications are going to be. You never know when yeah. it's going to be maybe you know infinite amounts of energy for the entire world or just a kind of nice bit of toilet paper. Yeah. So he's denying the world the best version of toilet paper that we could possibly have. He pretty much is. This was quite a big case at the time. I mean, big. Big for 1997, but the, like marketing week. <laughs> Wait, what cases for 1997? Yeah, no, sorry. Were were court cases famously usually very small in 1997? I just couldn't think of much of else. It? I couldn't think of much else that happened in 1997. Did Tony, Bla- Tony Blair came in in 1997. That's true. He? Big. Yeah. That's true. But Big I remember media. not really being on the front page of the newspapers because it was all about this toilet paper case. <laughs> mm, mm. Yeah, the <laughs> Hong Kong handover radar. barely got a mention, didn't it? Okay, all right. Look, we can all name something that happened in 1997. <laughs> <laughs> well done, everybody. <laughs> And the guests that they had, and I only listened to two episodes, unfortunately. I, I will be listening to more, though. Um, but it's just a lot of stuff been going on this week. Um, <laughs> so the one episode I did have, and, and again, I guess it depends on the strength of the guest. Uh, they had an astronaut who was a British astronaut who's uh, been to the ISS, you know, for the ESA. He was an okay guest. I wouldn't say he was necessarily funny um, mm. or that engaging. I mean, he's an astronaut, so he's not a comedian. Um, so, I mean, I think he did a fine job, but I do think that was a, I guess maybe that's the danger of bringing a guest into this show 
is that mm-hmm. there are times there could be guests who are just not that great. I mean, everyone's seen a Joe Rogan podcast with terrible guests. Um, right. So, you know, it, it's one of those things where I personally, after just that experience of, you know, that one episode with the astronaut, I'd be more inclined to watch episodes without guests, unless it's a guest I do know who probably would fit well within that podcast structure and within their type of comedy. Yeah, I I don't think I've ever heard an episode where, and again, I've not listened to the entire catalog by any stretch. Um, I've only been listening probably for, what, two years, and, and not all of the episodes either. I think all of the guests that I've ever heard were definitely comedians. I think that's definitely the most common guest. Uh, category. And I think that's because QI, I believe, is usually the panel is usually comedians. So uh, they have quite the network to work from. And in fact, I think a recent episode, I say recent, in the last couple of months, um, they had an episode with a comedian. I've seen her. I can't remember her name for the life of me, but she was been on Graham Norton multiple times. And she's also on the Great British Baking Show. She's one of the two, not the judges, but one of the two hosts. Mm -hmm. Um, or the Great British Bake Off, whatever the official name is. And she's she is really, really funny. Like kind of caustically funny. And that was that was one of my favorite episodes that they had because <laughs> she's just she is fantastically just real sharp witted and so yeah, I think the strength of their episodes with guests are kind of heavily reliant on the guests. I mean they can still make have a good episode and it still be entertaining and, and interesting but i do think it's much better when they have uh comedian guests on right <laughs> the i wonder which uh because there's been a couple of female uh i guess color commentators or hosts or whatever on the great british break off uh if it's who i think it is <clears throat> it'd be very surprised i probably need to listen to that because you know she said very caustic humor where she was almost kind of like matronly on the you know great yes. british break off show so Yes, that's her. She's kind of short and got yes, the short blonde hair. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, it, yeah. She is hilarious. Makes me think of uh, Bob Saget. You know, he was on. You know, he did America's Funniest Home Videos, with which was had terrible writing. And uh, oh, what was the sitcom he was in? Um, oh, the the one with the oh my just gosh. rebooted recently. Yeah. Um, oh, why fa- Family Ties? No, not Family no. Ties. No. Uh, but anyways, but yeah, he's like one of the raunchiest comedians. Like when he's actually on stage. Oh, I know. Um, I, I I remember when I found that out and I was completely shocked. I was like, what? What? He's like the wholesome dad on Full House. That yes, was yes. Thank you. I had to look it up because it was driving me nuts. Um, it's like he was the wholesome dad on Full House and he's like super raunchy and he really, really is. Like his brand of comedy is very reliant on it, actually, um, which isn't my favorite kind of comedian. But I just thought that was that was a very shocking. But yeah, it's a good comparison because that's kind of how she is. She's super sweet and, like you said, sort of matronly and or mothering to all the contestants on the Great British Bake Off. But her comedy is much more cutting and very sharp witted and funny. So yeah, so she was a really great guest, and they've had. I want to go back and do some research because there's certain people, certain com- British comedians that I'm willing to bet have been on there. Uh, I'm sure they've had Stephen Fry on. They have to have. And so I want to go back through their episode catalog and find those episodes and dig them out and listen to them because, um, and, I, and I think that's another thing about this podcast is there is no need to have listened to it before. You can just jump right in anywhere. You can start with old episodes. You can just start listening to the most recent episodes. There is no kind of through line or, you know, anything you need to know from prior episodes to be able to enjoy it. They really are truly standalone. Yeah, it, th- that's one of the things I appreciate. I mean, th- I mean, the whole, the, here's the funny thing. Like, I've always mentioned before, I don't like banter and, po- you know, and podcasts. Um, yep. it, it, but it's different with this because it's, it, the whole thing is banter with just like these right. weird facts thrown in. And, but again, like you're saying, each episode is very standalone. So there's not like some kind of giant, in, you know, uh, uh, in joke, if you will, among them that's, you know, been there for five years that you have to have listened for five years to understand what the inside joke was, right? That That's the kind of stuff that I just, I can't stand because I, I don't have the time to go back and listen to five years worth of podcast to really try to understand it. So it, it, everything did feel very um standalone like you said so and i think i will say and i what i learned looking at the uh, the titles none of the titles really tell you what the content is of each episode 
right? Yes. And which, Correct. So don't look through, like, if, you know, you're saying, hey, you can just jump in anywhere. Don't choose based on the title, because the title has <laughs> nothing to do with the episode. I mean, yeah, you had Unsexy Astronauts, but there was no facts about astronauts, right? Right. So, right. so don't, I, I don't know what the best way would be to jump in. I guess really just start with the latest and go, you know, go back or whatever. But yeah, that, that would be the hard thing is like finding, trying to find a good starting point to listen to this. Cause you have no idea what you're going to get yourself into with each episode. Yeah. And, and the facts, the, the titles to your point, it, it, it always is something that is said or mentioned in the course of the podcast, but it can be completely random and not related even to one of the main facts. Like it could just be something that came up in the conversation about that fact. And, you know, and usually it's something that's either funny or might be something that's mentioned multiple times. But in general, it it's it's not an indicator at all of what the content of the podcast is. So, yeah, the, the names are very, very kind of. I guess non sequitur. They're just they're just not helpful in terms of telling you what the podcast is about. Each episode is about right, but that kind of goes to the whole British humor thing. I mean, the podcast is called "There's No Such yes. Thing as a Fish," which I, I don't. I can't even like conceptualize what what how that t- is the title. But it's so British, though. It just made sense in a weird sort of way. I actually did research this, and it was from a fact that was on one of the episodes of the QI show. And it was um, it was basically a biologist who was writing a book, uh, you know, based on his research of, you know, marine biology sort of stuff. Anyway, and he concluded that there's no such thing on a, as a fish at the beginning of the book because he's talking about the fact that a salmon is more genetically close to, uh, uh, I don't remember what it was, an orangutan or something, you know, some other animal that's not a fish and than it is to a hogfish. It was basically... Because the the term fish encompasses so many different species and so many different things, he's like, there's really no such thing as a fish. And so they really liked that fact, and that's what they just decided to name the podcast. Because you're right, it sounds, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. It sounds like a British joke for some reason. I don't know why, but it just works. Like, you hear, if you heard that name, I'd be willing to hazard a guess you would say, that's probably a British show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, what's funny is that, uh, it kind of going in the line of British humor is that, you know, again, it's usually very dry and heavily self-deprecating, right? Yes, um, yes. And one of the things I saw, there was a video, and I, and I can't remember who made it or what the title of it was, but it was uh, talking about the differences between British humor and, like, you know, American humor in a way. And he was using sitcoms uh, as kind of the the yardstick, if you will, or the, you know, uh, the, the basis of his analysis. He was using sitcoms. Mm-hmm. And uh, in, in American sitcoms, everything works out at the end, right? No matter what kind of trials mm-hmm. or tribulations, the characters are all back where they started at the end. Uh, so that way, it, it can, the the setting is reset for the next episode, right? Right. Uh, whereas, it's usually always a happy ending. But in British mm-hmm. shows, it's always a bad ending for the character. They spend this whole episode trying to avoid something, but it happens anyways, <laughs> right, it's their their efforts are futile. So that kind of gives you the idea of just kind of the scope of British humor. Yes, which again comes off, and, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, like Black Adder, it works, but <laughs> you know, in this case, it works. So the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, it works, and you know, so Faulty uh, Towers, it uh, works. Yeah, Faulty yeah. Towers, it works. <laughs> um, but uh, there's some shows where it definitely doesn't work. Uh, but yeah, no, it's uh, it, it is a good. I really do enjoy it, and I thought it was uh, really funny. And it's something I will be listening to again once I kind of am able to fit things into my rotation. Um, yeah. So, uh, but again, I just kind of just randomly pick an episode, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, when I started listening to it, I just listened to the newest episode and then just kept listening as new episodes dropped. I didn't really go back. Occasionally, if I, like I said, I don't, because I listen to so many podcasts, Especially now that we're doing this podcast, I'm listening to, I'm adding more to my rotation each week because we're, you know, obviously have, have ones that I've not listened to before that I have to listen to, to to be prepared for the discussion. But, you know, I have so many podcasts that some of them are kind of my top ranked ones where I don't ever miss an episode. And if those drop, I'm going to download them and listen to them. Um, and then I have ones like this where I try to listen to them. But if I don't get to it, it's fine. I'll miss a week. You know, I'll catch it next week when it drops. It's not required listening to be able to keep up with it. 
where some podcasts, I know the kind that you don't like, it's more about the hosts and, you know, where they have kind of in jokes and or there's there's things that kind of continue to carry through the podcast. So you really need to listen to all of them. Um, this is definitely not that. Uh, so you can just jump in and, and start listening. And, and, you know, it doesn't it doesn't require a lot of work or research. Um to right. continue to follow it. And, and one thing I will say that I, I do really like is that the intro is very short. Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, we're talking like less than 30 seconds. And yep. uh, I, maybe maybe one ad break, maybe two ad breaks. Because um, they do like roughly around four facts, I think, per episode, it seems like. And yes. so there may be a, uh, an ad between uh, two and or one and two and three and four, I think. So, um, and the ad breaks don't seem to be very long either. No, they usually have, I, I think there are two ad breaks each episode and there's generally just one ad in the break and they do read it themselves, but there, I think there is usually two. And again, it's just one, one ad break. It's, it's either 30 or 60 seconds. I couldn't tell you which, but they're not super long. And generally I always listen to them because most of the time they'll crack some jokes and and my one of my favorites is when they do an ad for the economist which has sponsored them before they will they'll pull a fact from like the most recent economist you know and and talk about it a little bit and kind of riff on it the way they do in the show so their ads are actually not painful to listen to uh generally entertaining um so i generally don't skip the ads occasionally i will if it's one that you know it's a product they've advertised multiple weeks in a row and I've heard their take on it multiple times. I mean, each one, each recording is unique. They always re-record, even if it's the same sponsor. Um, but I'll, you know, I'll generally skip those. But for the most part, I don't even bother skipping. I just go ahead and listen because they're not long. And uh, what what network are they on? Um, I don't actually think they're on a network. I think because they're technically, I guess they'd be owned by the BBC because QI is on BBC uh, Two. Okay. So I think it's I think it's considered a production of the BBC. I didn't see any references to it specifically but um i'm pretty confident that it's yeah because they're the their press inquiries email is press at qi.com so yeah they're they're it's part of the the whole qi thing so, so it's definitely it's, a product of bbc so it's publicly funded interesting Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. <laughs> yep that that is interesting actually i always forget that about the bbc so it's actually illegal not to publicly fund it <laughs> Right. <laughs> like you, uh, you, if you don't have a license, you can get fined for not having a TV license in England. <laughs> yeah, actually, I was listening to a podcast about the history of that recently. <laughs> well, it, it, what's weird is that they even have signs like in the train and on the side of mailboxes and stuff saying no license. We know about it or something like that. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's a little that's, creepy. It's a little dystopian. <laughs> Well, they used to have vans that would like drive around and they could pick like with the old TVs, they could pick up if you had like a TV signal or something like they had a way of detecting if you were watching TV and if you didn't have a license, they could go after you for it, right? They could find you. So it was super, especially back in the 50s and 60s, it was like super uh, kind of Orwellian there. <laughs> and that's, you know, and that's the funny thing is like, I mean, there's some really raunchy humor in British television and... Uh, you can even say, it, and I will say this podcast, very, pretty clean. Like, I don't, I don't even remember if they curse in the episodes I listen to. They do curse sometimes. Okay. They have, in fact, there was actually an f bomb I think on the Reese Darby episode. It's not common though. Like, it's it's they do, but it's not like all over the place. Right. Yeah. It seemed to be pretty clean. Like even the content, at least the two episodes I listened to. Who knows? There could be a. a a super raunchy fact out there in one of those episodes, but generally their their humor itself wasn't really raunchy. It was yeah, no, and clean. for the most part, it's not. And even if it is, it's it's sort of you know they'll get giggly about something that sounds a little off color or you know could have a double meaning or a double entendre. You know they'll 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 specifically make jokes about those kinds of things, but it's not raunchy. It's just they they a few of the characters in the or characters but a few of these people are do have that kind of sense of humor where they you know will find something funny that's you know a little off color so but again to your point it's it's not super common and it's not like wrong i wouldn't even say raunchy you know it's, it's pg-13 super, yeah yeah that's exactly how i would classify it the the f-bombs are so rare that it would still earn a pg-13 rating <laughs> i think nowadays you can get two f-bombs in a pg-13 movie yes you can and I think I know that because of The Martian. 
because there was a lot more f bombs in the book than the movie, and they decided to uh, okay. to just to strategically pick the two that they wanted to use, and then they kind of worked their way around it a couple of other times. Anyway, so yeah, I think it's a uh, it's a fun podcast. Again, you're gonna chuckle. I do occasionally get a laugh out loud from it, you know, when they hit something really really funny. But it's it's great entertainment, and I think if you've ever seen QI or any other kind of comedy british show you're gonna probably enjoy this because it's just that kind of humor yeah so I, personally i i definitely don't hate it i i really enjoy it and uh, i will try to fit it in my rotation what i can um i would say i would listen to it based on the title but <laughs> i don't know what the episode is going to be about so it's really <laughs> if uh if i can fit it in i will yep yep same here i i definitely do not hate it and uh i'll continue to keep stay subscribed to it and as i can i will listen to the episodes Have thoughts you want to share? Send us an email at whyihateyourpodcast at gmail.com or visit our website at whyihateyourpodcast.com. You can also find us at Hate Your Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Our intro, transition, and outro music is by Kevin McLeod and licensed under Creative Commons. Please see the show notes for details. 